线的话，那就按上桌上的按钮嘛，就随时在我回答两个问题中间就随时打断我发言，呃，或者是问问题就好了。Yeah, exactly. All the questions that gets the most likes uh, will appear at the top of the screen, and you're you're free to, of course, ask your question in English or in Chinese or in anything, and and I'll I'll, I'll do the interpretation. Uh, I'll talk in English. English or Chinese or Taiwanese or <laughs> something else, I don't know. <laughs> 然后呢，我们还有直接可以在上面就针对已经提出过未提，呃，已经提出的题目，你还可以去按赞，也就是就啊，这个题目就算我没有提问，你可是太赞了哈。那我们是按照这个random来看，它次数最高的赞的就会题
Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and uh, if you happen to uh, not be able to connect to Slido.com, feel free to interrupt me at any time, raising your hand. Uh, even not raising your hand, just push to talk. And uh, I look forward to the conversation. And there will be no breaks uh, in the next two and a half hours. So if you feel the need to you know, go outside and take a walk and get back in, feel free to do so at any time. So, um, as I said, uh, the whole idea of this kind of conversation is to have you as the audience to set the agenda of this uh, conversation. And this is very interesting because before, without digital technology, there is no easy way for people to determine for a speaker, for a lecturer, or what exactly is what that the people want to hear. Of course, we have certain techniques before digital technology. It's possible for you to use some post-it notes and go here and write on a whiteboard and use some dot voting and so on. But half an hour would have passed before we get results like this, right? So the digital technology, it doesn't really replace the face-to-face -face meetings, but it does make it much more efficient. And this is the, the first, the most tangible benefit of digital technology. It let, let us use the same workflow as before, like the whiteboard, dot voting, and so on, but in a much more efficient way so that you don't have to interrupt my talking while you're proposing your question. So without further ado, let's take a look at the questions. So the first one is, how do I define a technological um, government? And nine people would like to hear the answer of this question. So uh, first, as a point of clarification, um, I'm a digital minister, uh, not a SNT, not a science technology minister. There is a science and technology minister. Uh, and there is a ministry of technology and science, uh, but there is no ministry for, for digital. Right? So, so I'm not a minister in charge of a ministry. Rather, it's a cross-cutting uh, role where I look at each ministry and look at how digital can help facilitate the mission of the ministry. So um, we do actually have a definition of how digital technology can play at the next AES. This is what we call the Digital Nation Plan, or DG+. DG+, stands for the development of the stable infrastructure, the innovation that we look forward to work with the private sector, the governance that we're upgrading how the government is conducting our own business inside the government and talking to the people. And finally, and to me the most important one, is inclusion. Meaning that as the digital technology move forward, we need to take everybody on this island forward also, and eventually the world. Not just 1% just of people or 10% of people enjoying the fruit of digital technology while leaving everybody else behind in a state state of inequality. And this has been the goal for the past four steps of the e-government initiative in Taiwan, is to leave nobody behind. And I'm very happy that uh, in terms of network readiness, digital inclusion, uh, women participation in digital life and so on, we are all consistently ranked top one or the second place in the world. And it means that we pay a lot of attention on inclusion. But the actual people who do inclusion, uh, who works best in Taiwan, is what we call the non-governmental organizations. The NGOs know what people uh, in their locality, in their region, look forward for the digital enablement and so on. So, <coughs> so this DG Plus has four different areas. The development part which is mostly hardware and infrastructure, uh, one-time costs. This is shared by the private sector, by the public sector, and by the civil society. So this is the fundamental infrastructure that all the forward-looking innovations can grow upon. This includes, of course, cybersecurity, of course, basic internet access, and so on. And because this is m m most of this is capital investment, we're now moving it into the so-called forward-looking infrastructure plan that was uh, debating right in the parliament in the in the past few uh, weeks now. So, so this is the capital investment part. And if you're interested in how we're positioning the infrastructure plan, you're welcome to visit infra that PDIS, that Taiwan. And this is um, linked from the um, EY, the Executive UN homepage. If you go to the Executive UN homepage um, and click
click the first link, which is the infrastructure plan, you, there will be a red button that says the frequently asked questions. If you click that, you go into the infra uh, page, the FAQ page, which is one of the work uh, that I've worked with the administration. So not just you can look at all the five, including the digital infrastructure, there is also all sorts of questions that people ask us all the time, whether it is necessary to use special budget, whether it is to rush through a black box, whether we will leave debts to our um, you know, descendants, uh, and so on, and all those frequently asked questions, uh, we ask all the ministries to come up re with reasonable answers, and we also welcome new questions so that this is a platform for dialogue uh, for the general public. So this is infrastructure, the part of the development. Now, as part of the DigiPlus plan, we explicitly say to the private sector that we know that you, you are better than the government to do innovation that looking forward to the future, some of those private sector companies are already creating the future. It's just not evenly distributed to the rest of the world, but they are at the, the edge of the future. So we say that we're now not really regulating or telling the private sector what to do. We still do our regulatory work, but the value behind the regulatory work is to facilitate you to sit down and look at what kind of experiments the private sector is doing. And for this, we have the, uh, the new plan called the Financial Technology Experimentation Act. Um, right, so I can only speak English, but there is no rule. This is I can't write Chinese, right? So, <laughs> um, so yeah. So this is what we call the fintech experiment, and there is a, a law that we just passed from the executive and are now in the hands of the legislators. The whole idea of so-called fintech experiments is so that people who are in the gray area, where it's not so sure that whether this regulation applies or not they can declare themselves to the financial committee saying, you know, I'm not yet uh, raising the full capital to be a financial player. And I have this idea, which may or may not run into this regulatory uh, burdens. But I understand that the government, for government to change the regulation, it is a very thorough process. It requires a lot of consensus from the society, and it requires at least uh, 60 days of public consultation now. So instead of saying, okay, this must change, we negotiate saying, now the financial um, committee, the regulatory body, promise not to sue this startup over violating certain regulations, but not laws. They, they can't violate laws, right? Certain regulations uh, in the next six months. In exchange, the startup promise to open up the process of its experiment to this independent review board so people can discuss whether this is a good idea or not. And they may adjust the scope of their experimentation or extend it after six months for another six months. But after at most 12 months, um, the, the independent panel will make a decision whether these regulations really should change is a good you know, experiment or whether the experiment has failed and everybody sees that it's not a good idea to adjust those regulations. But one way or another, the whole society wins. Because if we don't have this sandbox for gray area operators, some of them go ahead and just rush through anyway in the black market. We see this with Uber, we see this with a lot of companies that just go ahead and violate the regulations. So. In, in this kind of sandbox, instead of working against innovators, we're now working alongside and innovators and working with the whole society to see whether it's a good idea or not. So if this is a good idea, for another six months, um, both sides need to have some homework to do. The innovator can take six months to raise sufficient capital to become a financial operator or work with one of the existing financial operators. For the regulators, we can now run through this two months consultation period for the regulation that does need to be changed and also gather more stakeholder input in order to refine the regulation text so that this will be good uh, law going forward. So all this 
Adjustment period for the six months ensures that the new operator will now contribute as a legal operator in the white market, not the black market, for the society going forward. While the regulators stop playing profits, they, they don't have to forecast the future eight years from now by ourselves. Instead, we work with the innovators to do this work. So this is the innovation part of the DigiPlus plan. And in a similar fashion, the inclusion part, we work with non-governmental organizations. For example, uh, through open data, we work with this uh, GCAA. Um, there is this uh, project that uses the Environmental Pro Protection Agency's data, but it is a crowdsourced uh, campaign that lists not only uh, the raw data that was collected by the Environmental Protection Agency of all those air pollution sources from the industry and maybe from the traffic and maybe from other you know, weather incoming sources. So the whole idea is that people can have a visual idea of what kind of um, you know, air pollution producing companies are near their places and their current monitoring. And then also, uh, if you have some you know, first-hand experience of some violations that are not shown here, a very easy way for you to report and require the Environmental Protection Agency to look into it. So this is obviously a nonprofit organization in charge of this work. And it's funded not by big companies, but by crowdfunding, everybody donate a little bit of money and time in order to make sure that there is a consistent uh, flow of how to manage the air pollution issue here in Taiwan. So this is uh, led by this NGO, by this backed by the government. <clears throat> in the same sense, the government doesn't try to do everything the NGOs can do. Instead, we work not against MPOs, but alongside MPOs, providing the environmental data, the infrastructure, all the supporting things that they require, and then for them to lead a charge for the civil society to take a look at the air pollution issue. So this is the inclusion part. As you can see, this is exactly the same spirit as we're working with the private sector for the innovation part. So finally, for the governance part, and this is my main work, uh, working with the National Development Council to do a digital service upgrade for the policy making process that we as public servants are doing day to day. There are some very uh, you know, technologically sounding uh, trends here, but the whole idea of why we are doing this is to reduce those repetitive, non-useful non work that the public servants do every day. The whole point is that we can go home earlier, that we can, <laughs> we can not, instead of working until nine or 10, to fill in some repetitive you know, uh, systems or paper forms or running with an envelope containing some uh, public documents from one unit or the other, uh, we reduce this kind of repetitive work that doesn't require human judgment with digital services so that uh, we can just go home earlier and spend more time with our families or our hobbies. So um, the whole point here is to have a KPI that is negative, right? The, the less service you require to, to do something, the better. Uh, the less units that you need to contact in order to complete something, the better. The less cash, the budget you, you need to spend on um, duplicated services, the better, right? So all these kind of KPIs are, are negative KPIs, but this is important because otherwise our digital infrastructure will look exactly like our organizational structure, right? But that, that's not uh, very efficient, nor is it very humane. So the whole point is to move from the so-called e-government, just about compliance or efficiency, through transparency and openness, and to establish constituent value, meaning that the innovators get some value that they're looking forward, the nonprofit organizations get some value that they're looking for, and we, as the government, just open any data 
in all the departments that can aid those non-governmental channels to increase constituent value. And this is basically where we're at at the moment. We're pretty good at open data now. Uh, we're, I think, the second year now, uh, the world's top country uh, in terms of the Open Knowledge Open Data Index. But we're, we're not yet fully digital, not to mention smart. I mean, we, we like to say that we're a smart government or something, but we're, we're way, <laughs> but there's still, still some distance uh, from being a full smart government. So at the moment, I'm focusing on the open part, and we're starting uh, with some uh, trials or some small-scale experiments that goes all the way to data-centric or fully digital to enable constituent value. But the idea is to make sure that all the ministries can work together in a way that we call the open service model so that people don't have to uh, replicate their uh, existing services as the old e-government model. So this is my take um, on the idea of a digital government uh, using the Gartner 2015 model. Um, right? So that's the answer to the first question. I spent a lot of time hoping that there will be more questions. So let's see if there is. So after entering the cabinet, uh, what are the differences that you uh, perceived uh, right, from the um, impressions that I had before entering the government. I was, um, as the moderator said, a consultant to the National Development Council and to the uh, V-Taiwan rulemaking system. So I had some knowledge going into the government, but after going in as a minister, uh, what kind of differences do I realize and what are the priorities for the Taiwan government to handle and how, what is the methodology? So this is a little bit of a trick question because it's actually three questions. But in any case, seven people want to, to hear about the answer to the three questions. So um, just let me <laughs> get out of this. Right, so um, the first question is that as a consultant, um, like many what we call the enterprise management consultants, usually when people ask us about workflow, uh, reform, and things like this, there is an underlying assum assumption that people don't usually say, but it's an underlying assumption when people look for consultants like us. It's that the people inside the system are afraid to take risks to change their workflow, which is why we need outside consultants to redo this workflow design and to empower uh, the people already in the system because they're afraid of taking risks. This is the, the same as in any enterprise or nonprofit organization. So I, I was going into the cabin expecting to meet public servants that are very afraid of risk, that are like not willing to take risks. But I was surprised, I was wrong. Everybody, all the public servants that I met as a digital minister are very creative and not afraid of taking risks. They propose all sorts of very good ideas and are not afraid of uh, going through unit boundaries to talk with me or talk with their supervisors. And why is that? Because uh, as the digital minister uh, going in, I said to everybody who worked with me, saying that I am the public servant of public servants. So I will not, I will never give you any direct commands. You will never have to obey my commands. All my suggestions are just that, suggestions. And for people who choose to work with me, we have like 15 uh, volunteering staff. For people who work with me, any idea they propose, if those turn out to be bad ideas, that the public things are, are, you know, not worth the taxpayer's money, I will take all the blame. And if they happen to be good ideas, you will get the credit. So this is actually the reverse of many uh, public servants' uh, experience, right? Um, for many public servants, if they propose some good idea, you know, the elected officials get all the credit. And if they happen to get some blame, the media will somehow find the public servants and they take all the blame. So, so of course, in this kind of environment, uh, nobody will want to innovate or take risks because there is no reward to those risks. It is 
guaranteed zero reward and guaranteed some risk. Right, so after going in, I took this um, so-called servant style of leadership, saying I will, um, you know, just underwrite everything, and I will take all the risks, and then you take pretty much some of the credit, not all of the credit, of course. Uh, the premier, the president will, of course, still want some credit, but you will get your due share of credit. So in this kind of environment, I was very surprised to, to find that everyone who worked with me become very creative and not afraid of taking risk. So this is the answer to the first question. Um, the second question is that what is the priority task that the Taiwan um, government need to, to set the agenda setting? This is a very big question. Uh, in my opinion, um, and not, uh, notwithstanding the current you know, infrastructure plan, <laughs> I think we need an infrastructure to, to talk with people, to, to interface with the general public. Because it was perceived at the moment that the government's distance with the people is kind of far. And a non-governmental organization is close to the people. And even many of those private sector uh, companies are positioning themselves as closer to the people. And people are organizing themselves online and offline, regionally and also on the internet and also internationally. And they're also feeling very close to each other. It's almost as if just the public sector is distancing ourselves from everybody else. But it wasn't like that. Before the internet, before the digital uh, communication infrastructure revolution, it used to be that this distance, while still pretty far, was actually the closest distance of people to reach policymakers. If the administration doesn't, you know, do public hearings and so on, there is nothing in alternative to this kind of consultation. Of course, people can talk to their regional representatives, their village elders, their elected um, you know, townships, uh, leader of townships, and mayors, and uh, the parliament, and so on, and all the way to the elected officials, and then to the administration. But any message, if you have like five intermediaries, any message gets dropped, uh, or gets substituted with what the intermediate wants the, the next stop to hear instead of the original message. So when the administration runs public hearing before the internet, it was actually a, a pretty good distance for people to directly voice and talk with the relevant public servants. It's just after the internet revolution, people suddenly has a way to organize themselves not waiting for the media, not waiting for the you know, elected representatives, not waiting for their mayors even. Uh, they just form their ad hoc groups. They form their NPOs, they form their startups, they do uh, social enterprises that are very efficient at organization and gathering everybody's opinion and listening to each other. And now they say, you know, public hearing is not a good way to listen to people. This has not actually changed. It's just people's distance toward themselves has changed to shortened. And so this distance is now perceived as far. It wasn't actually, you know, farther than before, right? So I think this is this perception is the, the most important task. We need to say to people, to let people know that we understand that there has been a deficiency in mutual trust. Because the longer the distance, the more room for rumors to grow, for distrust to grow, and we understand there is a certain amount of distrust. And because trust is mutual, somebody has to walk first a little bit toward the other party, not expecting any trust in return at first. And we can't ask the civil society and the citizen to trust us blindly. So instead, we need to trust the people first, even the people doesn't trust us as much yet. So what, what do I mean concretely by trusting people? I mean, when we hear uh, you know, public consultation or a public Q&A system or any public communication or open data, some of us may have some associations in our minds, for example, populism, uh, for example, uh, you know, inappropriate representation or for example, mob mentality, or there is a lot of you know, negative words when we hear the words open data, public information, or open consultation. There is some very negative association that stem from the days of public hearings in the pre-internet model. But 
if we clear all this away from our minds, if we, if we see a blank page and we say, you know, we admit that, you know, we're just doing this business of governance, some of our work is not yet that good. We welcome contribution from everybody in order to make us feel better. And any energy, whether it's positive or negative energy, is energy. So we can use them uh, usefully and increase our own work. If we position ourselves like this, we, we're basically saying we trust people will not abuse the power that we're sharing with the people for agenda setting. And only with this kind of trust can we get people who somehow want to trust us a little bit more to collaborate. And if people still doesn't trust us, it's fine. Somebody has to move first. I think this is one of the most pressing uh, important issues. As for methodologies, there's many methodologies. Um, and for all kinds of different cases, it requires different um, technologies. Sometimes it is just about open data or public information. Sometimes it is about a, a more regular way of consultation. For example, this is the join platform. The join platform is the baseline of participation and openness. I mean baseline saying this is hundreds, literally, of petitions uh, at the moment that's ongoing. Just this month, there is a petition about improving the experience of people filing in our tax returns. Those tax return software is the prime example of the e-government era software. It's very compliant. It's very efficient. If you use your uh, electronic PKI card, you can get all your filings, returns, and everything into this tax return software and it completes um, the formula for you very efficiently. It is actually one of the prime examples of good e-government applications. But it is not very open. And this means, first, that the people who specialize in this service, in this technological side, is not well versed in the idea of user experience. So when people use a Mac, computer to complete your tax returns, it takes average maybe five times as much time as a Windows user to file their tax returns. And for many people, this is not accessible uh, because they, you know, they're used to Mac completing things at, at least as fast as Windows, but this is like a discrimination to many of them. Um, and even for Windows users, the, the, the interface sometimes looks like garbled characters because it's still using so-called Big Five encoding, and so they had to adjust their Windows settings. And finally, the whole uh, movement is very much like filling in paper forms. So even though it is actually much more efficient, it still leaves a, a kind of bad taste uh, after filing all those steps, just like after filing all those paper forms. And this is all about sentiment, all about kimochi. This is not about <laughs> functional uh, aspects of the, of the system. And of course, People are already on a very low Kimoji state when filing our tax returns. So anything that's in the software that lowers people's emotional state will be perceived as double or even triple. So for people who can't connect to the uh, mainframe computer for about eight hours in the first day of tax return, their negative emotion amplified by maybe a hundred times. And so they went onto uh, the, the petition platform saying, you know, this is not accessible. So, um, yeah, let's, let's take a look at the actual um, idea. Oh, there's a huge amount of idea. Um, let's look at it. Um, if I search for explosion, I think I can find it somehow. Here we go. Right, so uh, the text filing software is explosively difficult to use. And as we can see, there is not much actual content in the petition. It is mostly just an expression of anger. Right? Um, and if 
if we stop here, if we use the old public hearing model, if we just collect this opinion, there is not much that we can do based on just the sentiment because it is entirely a feeling stage thing. It is not really about facts or about ideas that we can use. But because on this joint platform, there is a collaboration. As we can see, three different units joined uh, together to respond. So if we uh, sort through date, you can see that after a few uh, input for maybe 20 hours or less than 20 hours, there's a huge amount of people sharing their feelings. I feel it's, it's actually great. I feel it's bad. I feel it's old. <laughs> and so on. Right. And then somebody uh, happened to, to reply here. Right? So um, I have this habit of just looking at the Google search result of all the new pages that mentions my name. I check it every 10 minutes or so. So when, when anyone mentions me by name on any public forum, I'll just get summoned into the public forum and reply saying, you know, um, contrary to popular belief, I'm not the science and technology minister, I'm the digital minister. Uh, and I talked with the participation officer uh, of the um, Ministry of Finance. For all the ministries uh, in administration, we have a participation officer who, like the media officer who talk with the media, or the parliamentary officer who talk with the uh, members of the parliament, the participation officers talk with the general public through channels like this, like the petition platform. So I say, okay, our PO is aware of this. And lo and behold, our PO appears by himself, not even 24 hours, it's a weekend, huh? uh, saying, okay, uh, we, we heard you, uh, and we thank you for providing uh, your, your first-hand experience and so on, and then we will uh, convene a participation office collaborative meeting, and then uh, here is what we know at the moment, but it is actually quite unclear. So why don't you share some very uh, you know, specific gripes you have with the system, and we will talk with the proposer. And suddenly, the, the whole, uh, the wind changed. Uh, people are asking, okay, how do we get into this collaborative meeting? And then, uh, how can we participate? And then, the, and then people start telling and asking for the screenshot for each of those text file in return, which they did get to this proposal today. And then um, they started organizing hackathons um, by themselves outside of the government to collect all the designers' input. They would file text returns together and then capture all the points in which that they see that can be improved and so on. So this is a, a new kind of relationship between the governing body and the people who petition. Instead of seeing them as people on the street who are against us, we see them as collaborators, as, you know, yeah, let's just find out what, what went wrong, what's, what could be improved, and next year let, let's do it better uh, together. So all this takes is for a ministry, for a participation officer to trust the people, to, to not see them as, you know, populism or ang anger or whatever, right? They just said, okay, here we agree that there is room for improvement, let's improve it together. So this is, I think, um, one of the good examples of uh, the methodology that we're taking. We take the people's petitions very seriously. We meet with them face to face. We record the face to face meetings and release the transcripts so that everybody who petitioned with the petitioner can all follow through the whole idea of converging on possible solutions. And then we commit ourselves to implement the solution. This convergence meeting uh, we hold every week, every Friday, for four hours on one petition topic or one uh, proposed topic. And 
every Monday at the uh, my meeting with the Premier and other ministers with our portfolio in our Secretary General, I will brief them on the topic that we talked about the previous Friday, so that all the ministers with our portfolio and the Premier gets aware that, hey, we're, we're now doing this with collaboration with the general public, and so they can set the tone of communication. They can talk with the minister, with the ministry, of how they can collaborate and help. And most importantly, they give what we call the binding power for, for this consensus to move forward. Because I'm not in charge of any ministry, I cannot get the binding power. The only uh, promise I can give for the people who participate in the participatory office of meeting is that I would explain to the Premier and all my colleagues that they understand where we are at but the final decision is always made by the Premier. So this is the, the current methodology. Um, how to develop a user-friendly e-system to caring the elderly? Now there is a, a standard answer to this form of question, is that you have to develop it with the elderly. Okay, so this is what we call user-centric design. And it is not just a slogan, it's not just a motto. It is a, a methodology that says, if you design a system with its users, even though you may get something wrong at first, it is guaranteed that people know that you're there, they can talk directly with you if you find something wrong with their experience, and you can improve based on the actual experience of the users instead of representatives of the users who are not themselves yet the elders that needs caring. But of course, how to do public consultations with the elders is actually a hard problem because many of them are suffering from mobility issues. Many of them don't have the habit of using a mobile phone uh, to record their messages or watch video streams. Instead of asking them to come to our technologies, we need to bring our technologies to the elders. So they just do whatever they're doing at the moment, but we need to bring those smart measurement devices. We need to bring um, a good recording devices for a uh, field study. We need to work with uh, ethnographers uh, to, to who work as maybe one of the care workers, but still recording their qualitative experience and so on, so that we have real in the field data and the real in the field communication channel with those users. If and when we have this kind of uh, in-place communication channel and the elders feel that they can speak or to, to you know, use other ways to let people know that the service fits their needs or not, when the feedback cycle is symmetric, meaning that the information or the service we provide is equal in bandwidth with the feedback that we can uh, collect from the people, that we can listen to those millions of elders, then we have a way to work with them as partners, even though they may not be that first. Uh, in using keyboard and mouse, that doesn't matter, right? So um, internationally, there is a lot of ways uh, to facilitate communication like that with augmented reality and virtual reality and smart bonds and sensing devices and things as data, this kind of IoT systems, but all those are just jargons if there is no specific use case like the tax filing. Uh, service design use case that we can walk somebody into. So, which is why uh, we're now looking in the digital government a way to work within those uh, different ministries and aided by uh, the NDC and also um, my uh, PDIS public digital innovation space for the service design, try to reform what we have at the moment, and then establish this kind of bi-directional communication channel with the existing programs in each ministry. So this is the, the, the basic idea. <coughs> um, <coughs> how do I think about the unreasonable speech uh, by the trolls on the internet? Uh, what are the idea of the media as an agenda-setting power toward governmental work? 
<clears throat> so again, this is actually two questions. But anyway, um, the trolls, the trolls on the internet. Um, as some of you may know, <clears throat> my hobby, my pastime, the thing that I do for fun, is to hug the trolls. Okay, <laughs> troll hugging. It is my is my hobby. And right, if you search for a troll hugging. Or troll hugging, right? <clears throat> the first Google hit is a, a a blog that I wrote in 2009 that says to the world that my hobby is troll hugging. So, and I've developed this hobby for many many years. It's just by that time I get to write about it, right? So I have more than 10 years of um, hobbyist exercise as a troll hugger. So, what what is troll hugging? The troll hugging is very simple to explain. <clears throat> for people who talk on the internet, <clears throat> it is impossible for us to see the facial micro expressions of the people who saw our words or listened to our video. It is still very much like television in this way, in that all the feedback channels are mostly just emoji and text that is the two main feedback channels. So while we can use 4K, you can use VR to, to record our message, the feedback channel, like the Slido here, it is actually pretty plain, which is why I still pay attention to your faces, your micro expressions, <laughs> to, to make sure that I, <clears throat> what I'm talking about is not you know, um, bored or, or very uh, you know, mundane to you, right? So, but this kind of real-time feedback, we don't have that on the internet. So it is impossible for a person to tell whether their message is being uh, embraced with excitement or whether it was a, a trolling, a very uh, depressing or a attacking uh, attention. Mostly they just know how much attention they get, whether it is the positive attention or negative attention. The, the payload of the attention is actually very blurred on the internet. So <clears throat> for people who crave attention, for people who don't have a very good uh, active social relationship in their daily lives, maybe nobody gives them a hug uh, in their real life, they will look for the hug on the internet instead. So <clears throat> they post something. But then <clears throat> they found in places like Twitter and Facebook, which is designed for social media, it's not designed for rational discussion, right? So they found that if they type, type some very authentic, like their life experience, nobody pays them much attention. But if they become a, a troll, that is to say, they post some very vicious, very divisive, very angry message, a lot of people come and give them the attention that they want, that they crave, right? But it is impossible to develop long-term relationship with people who cheers for vicious uh, sentiment. They're really just like a flash crowd. They come here and then they disperse. There's no long-term relationship. So for people who become trolls, the next morning they wake up, they're still feeling very empty because there's no long-term relationship to sustain their need for social interaction. So they need to post another message. Again, even more vicious, attracting even more people, but still none of it becoming friends and the next day, and then the next day. So by the time that we see those people with too much time on their hands, it's usually that they dedicate so much to this kind of repetitive behavior so they don't even have the experience to have those day-to-day -day relationship with people around them. It's a reinforcing loop. So my way of working with these pros is to give them the real hug that they need. Of course, it doesn't really mean that I look at their IP address and find their homes and really physically give them a hug. It's, it's not actually possible. Uh, and I, I, I must declare that I don't have the authority to do this. But, but I, I try to give them a hug virtually, which, which, means, which means if I look at the 10 posts that they post on those very vicious um, you know, uh, material, I try to look at just one or two sentences, maybe three words, maybe four words, within this very vicious post. I ignore everything else, concentrate on the constructive utterance, the core that was still left 
uh, behind all those vicious dressings and communicate very authentically, taking them very seriously and replying as much as I can to those parts that are constructive. And suddenly, the people who come in to cheer this personal attack or whatever, they see that first, I'm willing to develop a back and forth relationship. And second, that I'm, not, I'm immune to those personal attacks. I, I'm not attacked by them, it's useless. And so they can't waste my time by spending their time on these things. But if they do spend their time on the part that are constructive, they get my full attention. If they, if they spend one minute on composing the constructive part, I spend a minute responding to it. So they learn saying, okay, so the only way to get the attention that we crave, the long-term relationship that we crave, is to get constructive feedback in. So after a few rounds, the people who do personal attacks suddenly stopped screaming. They, they started to, to organize among themselves to propose useful constructive ideas. And then by, by the time that they consolidate on a consensus that are actually useful, I would then refer them to, to the staff or to any of those ministries saying, okay, now you can work together, right? So it's not saying that all the petitioners are trolls. Many of the petitioners are very reasonable people. It's just that they don't trust the government enough, right? So after a few rounds of this communication, they now learn that, okay, so whether we're reasonable or not, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is whether we can get a constructive relationship out of this exchange. Um, <coughs> as for the second question, it's, it's actually a very difficult question because media is, is a term that is so overloaded that there is a good definition now. Technically, what you're writing, this is also media because anything that mediates communication between two or more people is technically media. And when people may say mainstream media, it is actually very tricky because many mainstream media in print, they don't have that much presence online. And for the many uh, mainstream online media, they don't even have a paper presence. So again, the mainstream has already forked. And then even on the online system, there is media that primarily draw their sources on second-hand reporting or um, from the crowd or even third-hand reporting, which is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is also a media that are strictly third-hand reporting because they have to cite other second-hand media sources. So with all those different strata, it is very difficult to answer this question precisely. But I would then quote uh, McLuhan, who said, whenever you hate the media, don't hate the media, be the media. So the, the idea is that if, if there is some aspect of the media that you don't like, now there virtually costs nothing to start your own studio. Anyone with a mobile phone can start live streaming instantly. Anyone with a, a mobile computer or laptop can start churning out posts and blogs and curating contents. So there is virtually no threshold in becoming a media nowadays. So there is no excuse for the government saying, you know, the media hates us, they get our message wrong, when it costs almost nothing to start our own media. And so by media, I mean technically any way to interact with people. So I would say that the Q&A that we did, or like this one, or the PETIS website, where we talk about all the work that we do and publish, uh, just like any investigative reporter, all the meetings uh, in track PDS TW. You can see all the meetings that I chair. You can see all the topics, all the interviews that I gave, uh, all the collaborative meetings, all the speeches, all the visits, uh, even my diplomatic meetings uh, with the Koreans back in uh, April, and so on. So every single thing here is recorded. And uh, for example, the, the Korean one. And so the principle here, what we call radical transparency, is that we keep a very detailed record, and then we ask people who participate to give them 10 days, or 10 working days if they're public servants, uh, to collaborative edit 
this transcript. And then we publish the transcript that everybody agrees on. And this has two benefits. First, sometimes we attend a meeting with a lot of things to say so that we don't properly listen. So just by going back to the transcript at night and then going through what everybody else has said, it gives us a second chance to look at what people have said. And second, it gives us people some kind of protection because they will not be afraid of speaking their mind, always knowing that we can change it with some words that are less offensive when the public media finds this transcript. So it creates an environment of mutual protection. So uh, in this kind of um, radical transparency, there is no way that I can be quoted out of context because whenever any media says anything wrong about me, I can just bookmark this thing and then paste to their commentary board saying, well, it, was, it wasn't what I said. This is what I said, right? So, and then for the media who work with me, they also find this way of reporting extremely, you know, easy because every journalist has many, many different things to take care of in a single day. And so after an event, after an interview, because they have this kind of transcript, all they need to do is editorial, curational work, the work that any good journalist spends time on. They have all the raw material, they just need a way to present the storytelling to the people, and they will not be you know, constrained by the material that they remember in their minds because it's all there in writing. So the media, the um, downstream media, the media people who work with, with me also very much enjoy this format because it makes their work easier. They can spend more time with their families also, right? So, um, so, so far so good. And so this is another media that we're, uh, we've been doing. And of course we also um, record our own video and then we also make our own film. Um, has anyone seen this video? If you have seen this video, can you raise your hand? Uh, okay, one. <laughs> All right. So, so maybe we can play the video. They tell me that there is sound in this environment. So maybe we can give it a try. So while while we're waiting for it to to buffer and everything, um, no, it's just fine. It's just fine. Oh, too bad. <laughs> okay. So um, let's see if if I have it locally. It seems that I don't. Oh well, too bad. Um, this happens. So um, yeah, if if uh, you look for the open government hotpot, it is a a very short film that uh, the Peters team uh, kind of introduced ourselves to the general public during the Lunar New Year. And we're now, just today, working on the um, subsequent um, episode to this open government hotpot. We're now working on um, the open government Shawema. Uh, Shawema is a kind of 
food, uh, that there was a rumor of, of this is a kind of animal that just grows and so on, and people can find it in a night market. And then uh, we, we, we just today recorded a open government um film that tried to explain what happens when 5,000 of people believes the Shawema is a kind of animal and creates a petition and stop torturing animals and how the open government system petitioners so that we can work together to, to get through to the actual facts uh, instead of just uh, on rumors. So what I'm saying is that um, we're, we're kind of our own studio. And whenever there is um, this kind of topics happening in the in the society that threatens to um, to to undermine the democratic foundation of collaborative uh, fact checking or fact finding, uh, we develop some methodologies to work with it, and then try to set the tones of our own communication. Of course, we still welcome the media's help in finding our flaws, criticizing us, providing us constructive feedback, but the point is that we should not rely on media to set our message. We need to become our own media and set our own message. So this is a, a very similar question, how to promote the health system in Taiwan. Well, uh, the first thing is that there is very much all health system in Taiwan are now e-health. It, it, there, it, there is very few um, hospitals that does not at least uh, use the health insurance card or the health insurance system uh, to, to work with their patients and so on. So the promotion I got from this question, and I may be wrong, but I got the idea is not just those basic uh, healthcare systems, but more advanced form of caring, what we call the long-term caring, as the other uh, person has already asked, uh, who work proactively, not just waiting for people to get sick and get to the hospital and report what they have done, but instead know in advance that they are about to get sick, or that they need some preventative action, or they need some health consultation, and so on. And so for this, we need uh, Again, a digital infrastructure, and this is not because of the bill. We do need a digital infrastructure for this, um, because for many of those sensor uh, biometric data, you can't just use LoRa or use some very low bandwidth uh, transmission. It does require a high bandwidth transmission. So, for example, in public uh, health places, in many of those public clinics in the rural Taiwan, they're still stuck with ADSL lines with 500k uh, transmission mode, which means there is no way they can use Skype or any of those video conferencing to do remote diagnosis. It also means that if they have X-ray or other you know, high quality image scans, it takes a week to, to transmit all those, those data to a processing lab. Um, in, in some other larger hospital. And so this is not access accessible at all. Otherwise, it's actually faster for, for them to hire a driver and put some USB disk and just drive to those larger cities. So the whole point is that the electronic infrastructure should make things easier and quicker. It shouldn't actually put a burden on the whole workflow for people to wait for the slowest part. So the rural areas, uh, healthcare system bandwidth is one of the, the most important thing in the inclusion part uh, in the uh, digital infrastructure special budget. And the other part is, of course, a, a publicly accessible Wi-Fi system. Um, for many different cities, they have their own system. There is the TPE free system, the Tainan free system, the Taoyuan uh, MRT system, and there's many. Wi-Fi systems, but uh, before this year, there's no way to use the same uh, SSID, the same login to roam across all those different city systems, which means that for the device manufacturers of those e-health systems, they have to collaborate uh, with all those local city systems in order to log in. And also, there's many blind spots that are just you know, between two counties and so on, where there is no coverage for 4G or for i Taiwan. And uh, we thank, of course, the contributor, uh, the artist Wu Zhongxian, for reminding us that along the tai Taiwan high-speed rails, there are many such high, uh, blind spots, and there is no i Taiwan service in many of those uh, rural areas. 
So um, as a concrete deliverable, um, just this, before the September of the World Congress of Information Technology, we will make the entire THSR uh, iTaiwan Wi-Fi accessible, and also all the counties and cities that it pass through, and most of the Taiwan, they will now use the same SSID and the same iTaiwan public Wi-Fi system. And so this is one of the examples that it does require the government to get in. To say that a iTaiwan hotspot is now in the, you know, um, common shared pool of procurement, if you don't put it there, uh, it is very difficult for a local government to, to secure the funding that they need to maintain such hotspots. Maybe after one mayor get, gets elected, they put some spots, but then it gets out of service. But because now it's in the common shared pool of procurement, it can now be a long-running service. So. And, and this is just a basic underlying layer. There's many other layers. There's the security layer, there's the communication layer, there's the protocol layer, and so on. But for each of those layers, we use a very similar way. Instead of telling the industry where to go, we listen to the industry's voices and then try to work with the regional government so that we can, as efficient as possible, get the common-based standards that everybody can then innovate on top of it. How do I make government smart? This is a very smart question. Uh, right. Um, yeah, as I said, th this is actually a, a pretty well thought out schema by the NDC folks. We need this, which is the common uh, processing infrastructure. The Department of Cybersecurity, um, now headed by the Director General that was previously the MIS director uh, at the NDC. Um, he's now working with the uh, underlying protocols so that we can trust the cybersecurity standards of all those regional communications. And then the V Taiwan platform that uh, the previous minister, Jacqueline Tsai, established. Um, I'm still in charge of running the platform. Uh, it used to be that I was the consultant, the technological consultant, and she was the minister. Um, now I'm the minister and she's my legal consultant, so, so it's, it's actually a, a very symmetric relationship and we, we have uh, pushed through, uh, for example, the fintech laws uh, and some part of the new company law following the closely held companies that we're uh, working together and, and coming next month maybe we will have the uh, amount vehicles, that is to say, the, the you know drones basically, and also autonomous cars in the future, and also sharing economy and things like that, all will uh, pass through the V-Town consultation process. So, so all this is taken care of by other projects, and the digital government plan can then establish, based on these very firm standards, um, the API, domain standards, so that for transport, there is now what we call the PTX, the transport exchange. For environment, there is now the CDX, and so on. So for, for all those data exchange formats, we try to make them part of the decision-making process. It used to be that all the decision-making within a certain unit or a certain ministry does go to those data-based process, but when the time it reaches the minister, and reaches us, reaches the people in the administration. All those data get converted. They used to be very different formats, but they all get converted to the same format, the PowerPoint format. So when we receive those um, ideas and proposals and so on, they're in PDF or in PowerPoint format. There's no way for us to interactively check the models that was used to generate those forecasts and those policies. And if we ask, okay, what if we change this parameter, then the people there would have to bring it back to the uh, calculators and policymakers, and after a week, we will get the iteration. It is very slow uh, compared to what we can do with interactive uh, data processing. So one of the work that I'm doing at the moment is to make sure that when making decisions, the premier, the ministers, see exactly the same screen as the people who make the ground decisions and observations. So we can see that with the vegetable process that I uh, showed you uh, a couple minutes ago. Um, and then, right, so this is the, the vegetable process. 
model. It used to be that all these are uh, controlled and shown uh, by different, like the Weather Bureau, the, the Committee of Agriculture, the local governments, and so on. But now we collaborate and put them on exactly the same website. And then we publish this decision-making information to everybody um, who's involved in growing vegetables or well, just everybody. So the whole point is that because this data-based, evidence-based model is now the decision-making process as well as in the communication process. It is the same data that goes outside and the same data that goes inside the reporting chain. There will be much more incentive for people to streamline the data model here because it directly affects the decision makers, their budget. If we don't have this connecting system to the administration and to the decision makers, people may actually get more reward just working on a better PowerPoint template or something, right? So that the whole point of being data-based is to connect those data to the decision making process. And of course, this is also very important to make sure that all those data are generated in a consistent manner instead of just typed in by you know overworked uh, public servants. So all this is required before we can even think about a smart government. These are like the nervous system of the government. Before it grows to reach all the parts, before it's connected, there is nothing on which that we can grow a smart government of. So this is what I'm concentrating at the moment, and hopefully after a couple of years, we can talk about how to be smart. But at the moment, it is like adolescence. Um, when people are going through puberty, uh, when people are about 12 years old, 30 years old, 12 years or 13 years old, uh, the nervous systems in our brain starts to rewire, to drop the useless connections that are no longer connected to the adult life ahead to consolidate the memories so that people have a, a good identity of oneself and also a good relationship with people and so on. So I would say that our uh, infrastructure system in the digital government is now undergoing this kind of shuffling, right? So you will see more and more um, services being consolidated. And the consolidation doesn't really mean that the backend disappear. It doesn't disappear, but it learns to play well with other backend systems. And you will see many front ends being dropped altogether and consolidated into those experienced, designed uh, services. And these are the four services that we will start as a pilot to, to do this kind of service-based design. So this is uh, a concrete answer of how to make the government smart. And this is the Afabi website. So, this is a very frequently asked question. Uh, is, if a county uh, or a city doesn't get a resource, does it mean that they are not forward looking? Uh, um, so, actually, this is one of the frequently asked questions. So, let's just look at our QA. Um, I think one of the, the FAQs, uh, let's go to infra.pdis.tw. So pretty much all of the digital infrastructure plan are actually global. It's not just even one city or one island. For many of the open content, open standard work in the digital infrastructure work, or the artificial intelligence infrastructure is actually shared with the world. It doesn't matter where you are on the earth or even outside of the earth. You get to enjoy the open content of the 4K pipeline of the 3D model of many of Taiwan's places and so on. So this is not location dependent. And then, uh, of course, there are people who still think that there are, you know, so-called zero-dollar club uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't get anything, right? Um, so this is not, not actually true. Um, according to this Q&A, um, the whole idea of the forward-looking um, infrastructure plan is to make sure that people who don't get, uh, you know, in one of those infrastructure-based plans can propose their own budget in the fifth pocket of the digital, uh, of the whole infrastructure plan. 
that would be the, the urban, rural part of the infrastructure plan. So this is one concrete answer saying that it is impossible for a county or a city to get zero dollar because we dedicate one part of the pocket to the cities or counties that do require some of their own projects being done. And then, of course, the other answer is that some places like Taipei City uh, does not propose this many projects because for many of the focus in the infrastructure project, they really already has pretty good infrastructure. So, of course, it doesn't really mean that it's in a so-called zero-dollar club, but rather that they already have the infrastructure to work with the forward-looking policies that we do as part of our regular work. The whole point of the infrastructure plan is to get the regions that doesn't meet the basic minimum infrastructure standards, those with computers still running Windows ME or Windows 3.1, uh, who doesn't pass even the basic cybersecurity uh, standards, which are ripe for, for people who do cyber attacks or whatever, to upgrade them so that they meet the baseline standards of what we think of as infrastructure. And if some cities or counties already enjoy this kind of infrastructure or even more. Of course, there is very little in those pockets for them because they are now enjoying the regular uh, policy work. So we know the gap between the planning and implementation is large in the application of technology. How do you close this gap in Taiwan? Uh, there, there is no possibility to plan something that can be implemented exactly as planned. The only way to, to do something exactly as you think about is to do everything yourself. And there's very little thing that you can do this way. So for all kind of planning, what we need to do is actually a, it's like a, a whirlpool. It's like a, a, a circle. Um, if we plan too much too far and allocate all the budget at once, it is possible that the world will have changed when four years or six years down the road, uh, all this kind of construction is not actually needed. Which is why for the infrastructure for a looking plan, it is now uh, budgeted in a way that is renewed every two years, and there's still room for every single project to adjust or to get dropped altogether, or for new projects to emerge within the same pocket of money. And this is true from the initial planning. We, the infrastructure plan was planned like that. Uh, it's a fact that was kind of forgotten by many um, legislators. The, the whole plan was the eight-year plan because it's just one special budget proposal, but every single project is controlled and readjusted every couple of years. So the idea, again, is about building a feedback circle. When we have a technology, instead of mandating everybody to adopt the technology at once, we let the early adopter adopt it, sometimes running against the law. We set up sandboxes, experimental protocols, so that they can report to us how it feels like to use this kind of new technology. And once we have this few report, we then spread the technology based on what the society wants from this technology out of public consultation uh, stakeholder uh, experiences. So if all the stakeholders say now, okay, this is what we want out of this technology, then the government adopt this technology as a societal standard. But from the initial early adopters to this kind of like everyday infrastructure, easily 10 years would have passed. And this is normal. This is the normal case of any technology to integrate with the society. Any attempt that tries to shorten this cycle is doomed to run into very difficult adoption issues that people who are not ready for the technology gets uh, imbued with this task of accepting the technology. Or people who are using the technology gets undue uh, regulation from the government that doesn't really understand the regulatory technologies. So we need to think long term when we're introducing new technologies, which is why uh, our office has you know, VR, Vive, HoloLens, and I use it to do meeting all the time. But I'm not asking 
for the legislators to use VR to, to like ask questions to the premier, although uh, MP Huang Guochan did do that with the premier. But <laughs> this is saying that we're not taking away the parliament building just now, saying, okay, it's fighting too much, let's all do VR uh, MP debating from our homes, this will be much more peaceful. Um, but we're not doing that. What we're doing is that we're experimenting and showing some useful models. And when and if people feel they're ready, we can switch to this new model. We're not really inflicting it, commanding it on people. Is robot or AI worth of investing in long-term care? People may think it's too expensive. You know, this is the same argument as VR. Last year, VR was really kind of expensive. It costs about 40,000 Taiwan dollars to set up a, a VR, uh, basic VR environment. But when people are asking me to give a talk in Madrid, in the US, or in Hangzhou, I, I had a group of students in Kaohsiung and a group of students in Hangzhou who connected their classes together in virtual reality and I wore VR to go into their classroom to talk with them and, and just teach them how to build VR models of themselves. Um, so the idea is that there's a class with half of the seats and if I put on the VR I still see all of you but those empty seats are now see students from other classrooms and I'm already I was already the digital minister at the time so normally if I'm to fly to Hangzhou it is actually very difficult under the current political climate but you know, for my VR to, to, to appear in Hangzhou and to, to, to have this kind of discussion with Kaohsiung people and so on, of course I'm not taking any profits from this. The people here, the Premier uh, Office and Secretary General that I checked, and their minister that they checked, they all think it's harmless. And it's true, it is harmless, it's impossible to harm me through virtual reality. I will not get disappeared uh, by visiting this way. And for their, their legal framework, it's just like watching a movie. There shouldn't be a law this, that this allows watching an interactive movie. So I did teach the students this way, even after becoming a digital minister. And it would cost like hundreds of times much more expensive, both politically and economically, if I were to visit. And the same is with the MIT Media Lab. I drove this uh, robotic avatar in Madrid and also in the uh, Boston era and also in the National Palace Museum, the Thousand uh, Museum here in Taiwan uh, with the 360 avatar. And of those three experiments, uh, the only one that I visited right afterward is the Madrid one in Spain. And people generally think that after spending with my robotic avatar called Galatia uh, for a week, I join them after a week. They think that it's the same, it's continuous. It's just like my body, who was silicon, now become carbon-based, but it's the same person that they're interacting with. And for the next two flights, I didn't even fly there. So the point here is that every time I get this kind of invitation that are very difficult politically or financially, I say, yes, you may need to spend 40k NT dollars to build a VR environment. You may have to spend maybe 10k uh, to build a studio. Maybe you need to spend a public OK NT dollars to rent one of those devices. But compared to the time and the air flight and the you know carbon emission from the air flight and whatever, <laughs> this is actually very very cheap. And so. And you, can, you get to reuse this vehicle, right? So other people can visit you with the same way after I try it out. So while well, I'm saying that it is true that all these are kind of expensive when they are still emerging from the lab uh, here. But what we need to think is the kind of the even more expensive human labor work that we're trying to replace or substitute or augment with. We don't say, you know, we need a robot on everybody's computer by tomorrow. It is impossible, right? But just like the early computers who are replacing many of the most mundane tasks of entering, you know, just like numbers and adding through those numbers, the original uh, spreadsheets, it is possible to find those very labor-intensive uh, occasions where robots and errors are useful and then just start with those um, instances instead of 
overly um, committing to any specific technology. So again, in long-term care, there's a lot of things that robots can do. For example, a robot that automatically senses uh, people who stop their breathing when they're on, on bed and adjust the bed accordingly. Or people who need flipping over occasionally. And then even for things that still require human uh, intervention, it could be like an exoskeleton that augments the strengths of people, or even a remotely operated robot that is still flipping the bed and whatever, but it's remotely controlled by a VR-wearing uh, worker somewhere else, given the right uh, infrastructure, so they will not suffer as much uh, damage from their, their labor work because robots are stronger, right? So even before the full AI uh, takes over everybody's job, which is easily 10 years or more down the line for, for most jobs, we can already augment and work with machines, not uh, replacing human work altogether. The next question being, um, looking at the trends of the digital technologies and so on, how should the government's bodies and public servants adjust ourselves to um, just to look at uh, the, the most important parts to, to adjust. Um, this is kind of an open-ended question. Um, I think the, the idea here is that to, to remember that if you get it wrong, there's usually no risk. If, for example, the tax return software improvement that we're now doing with the petitioners First, we have a year to do this, right? Because if we complete it in a couple months or three months, it doesn't matter because the tax return has already passed, right, by then. So given a year of experimentation, if we just get some part of it right, like the Mac experience, but we didn't fully solve the Windows experience or, or so far and so forth, there's always the old system that's there, that's stable, it's just kind of ugly, but, but we can still use it. So for many of those innovations, they're continuous, meaning that if you get it wrong, you can always go back to the older system. And you, this is a luxury uh, with digital system, with virtual reality. You can break a lot of things in this kind of environment. If you're building a bridge, you can't say that. If it breaks, there is tremendous social cost associated with it. But when building digital systems, it's very easy to start small, to experiment, to pilot, and then to scale it out. So this has a fundamental different nature than the scarcity-based uh, physical spaces and objects that we work with in other areas of development, which is also why in the infrastructure for a looking plan, we only booked four years uh, as opposed to eight years in the other plans because we honestly don't know how the world will look like in like after four years. It's easier to just predict the infrastructure needs for the next four years and let everybody grow out of those infrastructures and then we look at what kind of infrastructure that we need. It's because in digital areas it iterates faster, it evolves faster. So just relax, that would be my <laughs> suggestion. Uh, there is very little cost if you get it wrong. It is usually possible to try many, many times before you get something interesting out of it. And um, if anyone uh, gets it wrong and you feel that the society needs to blame you, uh, feel free to contact me and uh, I will absorb the blame. So uh, whether it is possible to actually run the real world environment, the so-called virtual world, cyberspace regulations. For example, what, what kind of uh, law applies when a service administrator deletes a virtual goods? Um, is there some other examples in other countries? Yes. So there is actually a law at the moment uh, in administration we're still processing it. Uh, it's called the Digital Telecommunication Law. Uh, uh, it was drafted by, the, by NCC. The previous version was uh, go, went through the VTAL1 process, and the current version went through the joint platform process. So there is a lot of stakeholder input informing this law. And this law uh, is very special in that there is no ruling body for this law. Even though the NCC people drafted this law, it says very explicitly that this law is like a map that maps things that happen in the cyberspace 
to the behavior that's already regulated by the criminal code or by the civil code in the physical space. This is because different judges judge differently for things that appears in cyberspace. And so it, it is very difficult uh, for a judge that doesn't have first-hand experience in this kind of cyberspace endeavors to judge uh, in a consistent manner. So most of the other countries introduce a what they call a, a normalizing way to uh, map the things that happen in the cyberspace with their existing codes and law. And this is exactly what we are doing now here, also with the um, digital telecommunication law. So yes, this all goes back to the civil code or the criminal code. And um, you can just look at one of those joints discussions for the digital communication law. In fact, this question appeared as one of the questions on the joint platform. So you can look at NCC's answer there. Um, so, wow. Uh, how does highly ranked public servants with the average age of 51 years old uh, to immerse ourselves um, into the technological uh, government um, except for retiring. Um, I'd like to tell the story of my work in the 12 year, the K-12 curriculum committee. Before I became the digital minister, I was one of the committee members in the K-12 <coughs> curriculum committee, Xuan Ning Guojiao Ke Fa Hui. Um, and uh, when I went into the development committee, the average age is easily 61 years old. Uh, it's, it's 10 years higher than you, you vote. They're, they're all principals and senior educators and like, like very old professors and who knows everything from, from the education area. And the, the principal who sit next to me, uh, the principal Sun Mingxia from Kaohsiung, uh, I think she taught for, for 50 years or something, uh, and if, all, all the way from the, the basic uh, education all the way to, to the senior high schools and so on. And she's, I think, 70 or so. So in, in any case, what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't matter how old you are. When I introduced this kind of radical transparency uh, where I type down and later uh, a stenographer types down everything everybody said, we collaboratively edit for 10 days, we spend two time talking with the public, we run a public consultation, and so on. She was the first uh, person who modified who proposed saying, okay, I didn't, when I said this, I did say this, but I mean this, uh, uh, amending her own uh, talk, and then uh, also providing supplemental information, and so on, through email. So I was very surprised. Uh, she's like one of the oldest members of the committee, but she's very avid uh, in using the technology, because everybody in the committee at the time feels um, feels kind of wronged by the popular media. The popular media kind of conflates us with another group of people who would remain anonymous, right? Who modified the previous version of the public curriculum. But, um, but because we adopted transparency, uh, people trust us more and uh, generally gives us a better time. Just let me switch to something else. Right, we have another 45 minutes or so, um, and after changing to a laptop, finally I can show you the movie that um, I kind of want to show you anyway.
胡萝卜、芹菜一起熬煮，来个七七四十个小时，然后最后还要用丰富菜宝来增加高汤的深度。等一下，等一下，不对不对，哦、我告诉你，我妈妈教我们家祖传八百年的，这个汤里面一定要有葱、姜、蒜、辣椒、花椒，要先炒过。再放那个中药，八角啦、小茴啦、桂皮啦，然后每一都。争什么争？别再争啦！让线上正在参与公共政府开放直播的网友来告诉大家。争什么？参赛一起做就以平台大火锅不就行了？笨蛋！他后面有说笨蛋吗？<笑><笑>嗯，这食材真新鲜，是谁负责的、啊？哎，是我。哦，哦，这汤头真干纯，是谁负责的、啊？是我，我，我，我，我。我。But 火锅最重要的就是沾酱了，所以我说那个酱汁呢，放上。<笑>呃，没事。这个素食可以吃吗？那这个猫舌头泡蛋可以吃吗？哎，这个乳糖无奈可以吃吗？哎，这个减肥可以吃吗？大家放心，我们火锅制定的过程不但从最先期就纳入了各界的专业意见，而且呢，在过程里面也会照顾到各个不同的利益相关的群体的声音。只有这样子，才能够让全民的腰围不断，幸福指数达到最大值。<笑>好吃了，我从来没有吃过这么开放的火锅。食材的料理方式都公开在里面，参与的关系人都可以尽情的发言，再配合逐字稿的发布，让外界了解料理的过程。为什么？为什么要让我吃到这么开放的火锅？要是我以后吃不到怎么办呢、啊？没有关系，不怕吃不到。现在就上 P D 四点 T W 的公共数位创新空间小组的网站，让大家随时都能够更新开放的内容。一树大家吉祥如意，鸡年行大运。to say that this remains a, a model, a, a ideal. It is not saying that uh, we are all the way to step four at the moment. We're very much still on step one, which is transparency. We're still figuring out how to get transparency right. And the participation builds on the foundation of transparency. So we can't really do participation if we don't have a good transparency, because then people will be talking about different things in uh, participation. But it is important to know that this four-step model from transparency, participation, accountability, all the way to inclusion, is actually, there is, it's not our interpretation. The Open Government Partnership, the OECD, uh, United Nations, pretty much open government just mean these things uh, to everybody on Earth at the moment now. So the point is not how to define open government, but rather how to implement it in a way that's uh, accept acceptable and useful to the people here in Taiwan. So um, as you can see in the film, not all the stakeholders like uh, to be held accountable, right? There are people wearing knives. Uh, and not all the uh, ingredients are yet converted to open ABI or open standards. And not everybody who participates are civil. Some people call other people bozos, right? So all these are our actual issues that we face when doing open governmental work. But the final vision is toward that of inclusion, meaning that after going through the process, more people care about public policy than previously, and more people get constructive input into the policy game making process as compared to previous era. Um, so this we did, uh, and this we also did, uh, kind of. Uh, the, the main point being, just like in the K-12 committee, that the whole point is to, to start organizing and start talking about your day-to-day -day operations. And maybe, just maybe, it is actually easier to, to use the electronic equivalents of the workflows, just like uh, Principal Sun Xia found out. Afterwards, she doesn't need 
to take very detailed notes of what other principals and committee members promise to do because we have this transcript. She can very easily use that to ask on the next uh, committee meeting what exactly get done, what didn't get done. And her staff also get a copy so she doesn't have to explain from memory uh, what kind of decision gets made, what was the context, is that her staff can see the actual transcript also and determine what to do afterwards. So at least in the K-12 committee, this was uh, not just a way to show the society that we're not corrupt. It is also a way to improve the efficiency and mutual trust of everybody who gets involved into the K-12 curriculum making. Um, the mainland China um, restricts and controls uh, people's um, e-commerce um, cross-boundary development in order to facilitate their own local industries and upgrading their systems. How do I look at those diverse forms of um, cross-national e-commerce, social media, e-payment, uh, open versus protection? For me, huh? there is no, uh, there is no dichotomy. There is no dilemma between open and protection. The openness, the the transparency, is built on the foundation of cybersecurity, of, of protection, of trust in the infrastructure. If there is no trust in the internet infrastructure, there is no way for people to share their thoughts, to share their creations, to share their ideas on this internet space. So the trust in the foundation, armed with cybersecurity, with mathematics, with cryptography, and protection is important. So security for me is a, a subjective experience of feeling secure. Uh, and it's important not to mislead people to feel that they are secure and protected without actually securing and protecting them. And it's also important to not uh, build those systems with those uh, secure uh, properties on the outside, but actually lacking in its mathematical foundations, which is why we put cybersecurity as the first pillar, not just in a digital nation plan, but also digital infrastructure forward-looking uh, plan. So. This protection to me uh, is the government's duty to ensure a, a safe, fair playing ground for everybody. It is just that uh, the mainland China is not exactly internet, it's, it's a lowercase internet, it's like an intranet um, in, in their, their own um, policy making process. So of course they can do a lot of uh, local innovations, just like you can do in the intranet in, in one enterprise or something. But the flip side is that many of their contributions in e-commerce and so on, it is actually kind of difficult for them to get into the markets of other open internet countries because they were built on the premise that is not true in other parts of the world. While in Taiwan, when we have develop some user experience, some games, some interactive fiction, and whatever, even with very locally populated uh, content, right, like Fan Xiao, it is actually very easy for the public, general public, even people who didn't hear Taiwan before, to adopt to those digital content and to uh, interact with this uh, international platforms like as Steam or, or some other uh, interactive social media platforms. What I'm saying is this, uh, Taiwan, although regionally kind of an island, uh, on the internet, every place, every node is an island anyway. <laughs> there, there is just this interconnectedness of uh, digital sharing, digital content, and so on. So if we establish our contributions in a way that connects to the rest of the public internet, then our regional innovations get scaled very quickly. Of course, the flip side is that other innovations from other countries are very easy to take root in Taiwan also, right? Because there is no so-called protectionism going on. But I think this is actually a good thing if the regulatory structure can welcome these innovations and work out a way, like I described in the sandbox um, experiment law, a systematic way to invite those innovators to Taiwan and uh, you just as a lab, to, to test those ideas and in a way that is safe and compatible with other um, you know, countries with similar codified law systems. So I think this is actually one of our opportunities as a very tolerant, diverse society to, to test out those ideas while 
enabling our uh, innovators, our young people, to build on the top of those foundations that was established by a multicultural ecosystem. It would be completely different, of course, speaking, if I'm speaking inside the, the Great Firewall, it is a completely different ecosystem. So, so different that I think any comparison doesn't even mean anything. Um, because it's just like two branches of evolution now, internet policy speaking. So, um, I, I wouldn't say that one is good and one is bad, or one is open and one is closed. I would say that it's a different governance model. It's like two branches of evolution. Eventually, we can see how it looks like uh, when, when it uh, brings out innovations and so on, but I, I wouldn't say that we need to arbitrarily compare one model to another. It is just like two different species coexisting uh, in the same um, ecosystem. So, right, so um, is a open, transparent, uh, with the full recipe, uh, this kind of a hot pot, is, is it more delicious? Or whether it's the old grandma uh, who doesn't even know how she do does it, but somehow just cooks a, a good hot pot, uh, like tells a story and, and whatever, right? So, so these two are actually not um, at odds with each other, right? It, it doesn't, um, it is actually possible now to just take a hot pot and somehow reverse engineer its, its ingredients. It is possible to do an ethnographic survey with the old grandma chef so that uh, her steps uh, like gets recorded and, and somehow um, gets uh, transcribed. What I mean is there's of course a lot of wisdom in policy making that cannot be reduced to procedure. Uh, and I'm not saying that machines or computers should replace policy makers' value judgment. All I'm saying is that all this digital infrastructure saves us time on the task that people uh, do routinely, meaning that even two different people who do exactly the same thing, they would do it exactly the same way and have the exactly same result. For these kind of repetitive tasks, which comprises of the majority of a public servant's working day, um, there is room for machines to help. But if for the part of the day where you exercise human judgment, where you do communication with uh, fellow human beings, then the most thing that the machines or digital technology can do is to make it easier uh, instead of you know replacing it. This is very important. One of the um, things that we did during the Uber deliberation was uh, this Polis system, which is so-called AI-powered conversations. But this is not uh, like many other systems where they read from Facebook or PTT posts and try to find what people like or what people doesn't like from those text mining. This is more like a forum where people can voice their own opinions about what to think about uh, the policy. And we ask everybody to start posting their ideas with I feel that. Right? So I feel that there is a certain risk to take uh, unregulated vehicles. You can see people on one side broadly agree and the other side broad broadly doesn't. And the other side, like everybody <laughs> in this group, uh, said, you know, Uber's rating system results in better driving behavior. And, and everybody here agrees, and even some part of the group one does agree as well. And group three cares the most about insurance, about the protection as a passenger. And group four talks about the commercial model uh, and thinks that uh, uh, the taxes shouldn't be painted yellow. There should be other colors uh, in the taxis and so on. So, and for people who answered a few questions like this, they can write their own opinions for other people to vote on, and their avatar would move um, through different groups. So this has three benefits. The first benefit is seeing that all my Facebook and Twitter friends are all over the place. They're not enemies, they're my friends. It's just we didn't talk about this over dinner, right? So it doesn't uh, let people antagonize each other. And the second good thing is that it lets people see that people's idea can change. They can convince each other and manage to find out something that convinces everybody 
pretty much everybody anyway, uh, across the board, regardless of which group they belong to. And this is important because instead of um, Facebook or PTT, the loudest, the most divisive corners dominate the discussion, this conversation space highlights the things that unifies people together. And we say that only the people with the sentiments convinced a supermajority of people, 80% or more, gets into the agenda where we use to negotiate with Uber. So it gives the binding power to people who can manage to find ideas that resonate with a lot of people. So this is actually the full list. Uh, it used to be about seven uh, thoughts here that everybody pretty much agrees. And these are the things that we use publicly to consult with all the stakeholders uh, in the great Taipei area at the moment because Uber hasn't expanded to the south at, at that moment and come up with this regulatory changes that we try to adapt to Uber. Now, if we use the traditional questionnaire, survey, polling method, it is impossible to ask everybody's qualitative statement this way and aggregate it meaningfully. So we will have to just divide it into maybe nine or ten different questions and to show maybe 70% people want this, 60% uh, people want this. We will never get to a super majority because it's impossible for a questionnaire designed to anticipate this converging uh, practice which took about three weeks or four weeks to converge. And if we do this like a, a poll every day to a, a randomly sampled people, uh, not only this is very expensive, but it leaves a lot of um, work to the people who process those uh, new sentiments, check them with duplicates and then so on, and who has to work every night in order for the next day's voting to actually make sense, essentially doing computers work. Right, so this is actually uh, what many assistants at the Judicial Reform Committee um, is doing now. Right, they, they use humans as uh, processors to, to try to converge their opinions and so on. So what I'm saying is that uh, AI or machine learning, when deployed this way, they're neutral in the sense that those are the processes that a assistant will do anyway. And two assistants will produce exactly the same result and the methodology is announced well beforehand. But what we're doing in a interface here is to show people that it is possible to converge towards something that everybody can manage to agree with. So this is the way that we're, we're deploying uh, this transparency menu. <laughs> so th this transparency menu talks more about the pot itself, about the kitchen itself. It talks about the spice. It doesn't really replace the chef. The chef is still there. It's just she's made much more efficient by those robots that cooks with her. And also that the, a smart kitchen that can remember the decisions that she has made. And so the next chef, when she's being trained to be a chef, is actually taking much less time. Uh, personally, I had this experience because um, when Simon John, the previous premier, uh, leaves office and starts the, the transition after the election, he asked all the ministry to produce a checkpoint document uh, and upload it on the public internet for the next uh, Lin Chen to, to take over, right? So it is not really a transition from one party to another party. Both of them belong to, they're independent, like, like I am, or we belong to no parties. Um, the idea is to transfer the policy-making state to the entire public, not just Taiwan. And for everybody, including me, and I was like, I didn't know I would become a digital minister. I was just interested in where the country is going. So I checked uh, the, the checkpoint documents and learned from it and look at the research and the data and so on, just as a civil society member. But when I'm uh, like recruited into the digital minister, I don't have to start from scratch because there is sufficient open data and checkpoint documents so I can follow the policy making process before becoming a minister. So it also making a training to become a minister much easier because I get to self-educate in a way instead of stepping in and then starting uh, from zero uh, at day one. Do I think there should be ethical rules in the digital world or not? Um, so 
it is very interesting because this is asking ethical rules in a deontological way, right? You should do this, you shouldn't do this. If you think already deontologically, of course the same um, mandates uh, still carry into the digital world. There is no, no change at all. But um, the, the, this way of deontological thinking is, is interesting because on the digital world it is much easier to connect with just the people who think exactly like you do morally. Uh, in, in the physical space, people often has to make compromises because our neighbors all think like differently, ethically, than we are. There's subtle differences, and so we have to talk it through. But because uh, in the internet, it's very easy to look through keywords and so on to find what we call an echo chamber, or in Taiwan, called the stratosphere, where everybody just follow the same uh, self-proclaimed rules of conduct and so on. So it's very easy to reinforce those rules online because then people just work with people who think and talk exactly like they are in a filtered bubble. But the what well, it is two sided. On on the first side it is easier for people to feel not as lonely, right? So so feel people who share a same sense of, of value and so on. But on the flip side, people often get into their own version of reality and, and reshape the reality and the narratives and stop looking at anything that talks the, with the same way, but with a different angle. So the most extremely people here doesn't even see uh, the lives uh, and experiences at the other end of the spectrum. This is what usually happens online. So as a public service designer, what I'm trying to do is to construct a space where we can look at the life's experiences, the facts of everybody, and regardless of which echo chamber you're in, and um, respecting that there are other ethical or deontological uh, systems in the world and that people can nevertheless agree on specific points. If we start this deliberation talking about sharing economy, digital economy, platform economy, or those very high sounding words, there is no way that we can converge to a consensus because people will just say it's ethical, it's unethical, it's whatever, right? But if we focus on a specific practice, then it is possible for people who are of different belief system to nevertheless make a compromise, something that they can all live with, even though they're not perfectly happy with it. You will know that this is not 100%, but they can live with it. So meaning that they will not actively think this is an unfair process, even if they have to make some concessions. So I think there should be ethical rules, but it, it is also should be a meta-ethical rule that makes us respect other people's maybe different uh, ethical system and nevertheless uh, form overlapping consensus. How do I start my day? <laughs> I, I start my day, uh, well, it depends on which day in the week it is, right? Uh, <laughs> For, for Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, I, I go to the administration uh, for work, and it's very predictable. Uh, the alarm would ring around 8 a.m., and I wake up and uh, uh, like check all the like instant messages and emails and whatever, uh, and then check my inbox uh, to, to see my schedule and so on, uh, while still in bed. It's all on a tablet, right? So <laughs> after, uh, like, um, finishing the, the day's planning, which usually takes 10, um, 10 minutes or so, uh, I will finally remember to brush my teeth and so on. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then get ready for work. Right. But, but if it's a Wednesday or if it's a Friday, then I, I work outside of the administration. For Friday, I usually go to the collaborative meetings with petitioners and so on. For Wednesday, I work with the Gov Zero v Taiwan contributors. It's not that I don't work, it's just I don't work in the administration. And uh, even though uh, sometimes I pass through the administration, I commit myself to even just staying in one coffee shop next to the administration. I just won't walk into the administration building. But why is that? Why do I have to spend my time away from administration building every Wednesday and Friday? It's because of digital government. If I'm, if I'm in the administration, many people just get a red envelope or a green envelope or something and, and they just run to me and say, Minister, sign here, right? And then, and then uh, people would just send me those arbitrary copies of very large volumes of books 
and then assume that I will very quickly finish reading it and then just sign somewhere. Um, but, but it is impossible for me to cross-reference papers with online materials or with evidence, with open data, with uh, whatever. None of my training is trained to, to do this, this visual paper processing. So, but for people in the administration, this is quicker. Because all the ministers with the portfolio, our office are all on the ground floor of the administration building. So they just have to you know, do a tour uh, to collect everybody's signatures and so on. So, so it's, it's very easy for, for them to, to do their document processing this way instead of through the e-document system or through email and so on. So just by introducing an artificial delay of two days uh, in, in parts of the week, it makes people think and see that it is actually faster to reach Minister Tom if you use the electronic system. Because I'm always online, and uh, if you just use email or any of those uh, uh, messaging systems that we set up as part of what we call ey.pdis.tw, this is a workplace system that we set up uh, actually uh, the first week uh, I spent in the administration was just manually constructing this, uh, this sandstorm system. So the sandstorm system is a self-hostable web productivity suite, and it has a chat room, uh, a file storage, shared file, um, task project management, much like Google Docs, there's shared spreadsheets, there's, there's everything. And it costs nothing, it's free software, uh, and uh, does, uh, like I was one of the contributors uh, to this system. And so the first thing I did was set up this system and make sure that it, it is good enough so that we can run our entire uh, workflow system um, on top of this system. And so, uh, UI. Okay, I see that there's some firewall rules going on here. So you just have to use your imagination, uh, or not. Uh, just remember that there is a introduction here. Um, it's called Chu Xin Zhe Shou Ci, one o one. Here we go. The PDIS one o one. So, as part of PDIS, um, we provide this interface. To, to these people, which formed uh, the core PDIS group, uh, and then we all collaborate on this workspace. And then, um, instead of using post-it notes like this before this system gets uh, verified by the cybersecurity department, we are now, because now the cybersecurity department says, okay, this is secure, uh, we, we are now fully transitioned into this uh, transparent workplace where everybody can see what everybody else is working on. And so um, every week we do meet face to face and draw a collaborative roadmap and then uh, start sharing documents on this kind of workspaces for all our projects. And the net effect is that to uh, communicate with me on this system takes a roughly 15 minutes or so for me to respond meaningfully. Whereas if you start using paper-based systems, you'll have to wait two days or three days until I return to the administration building. So after a while, everybody learned to reach me using electronic systems because it is actually faster. But if I go to an administration every day, um, I would not have this chance to, to convince people that actually electronic documents are actually faster. So this is how I start my day, and uh, depending on the uh, week, weekday, um, which day of the week it is, uh, I work differently. I sometimes work in the administration for face-to-face -face meetings, but for more time, like four days a week, I'm outside of administration, but I'm always reachable uh, through electronic means. For the sake of safety information, our government is too conservative in development in technology in Taiwan. How do I break this situation now? As a conservative anarchist, uh, I am actually in favor of being conservative. So I'm not actually looking to break the situation. Um, I'm an anarchist, meaning that whenever I face with a decision that concentrates more power to a few people versus decentralize more power to the general public, I always choose 
the latter way. I will never choose the concentrating way. And you can see this decision on, for example, the rumor, the so-called fake news decision on the uh, publication of vegetable prices, on the disaster uh, recovery um, information, the MX system, and so on. So all the cases that I uh, um, chair as a policy maker, I choose in a way that will empower everybody instead of just a few people. Um, and so this is important, but conservative is also important. It means that nobody should be forced to change before they're ready for it. Uh, we are a um, democratic uh, government system. It means that we cannot uh, abuse somebody's human right or somebody's privacy in the name of fulfilling the grand destiny of the other 23 million people. It is actually incomparable. We have to actually respect everybody's own temple of adapting to technology and so on, not saying, you know, this is the country's destination and we just eliminate the people who say no to it. We can't say this. So I think it's important to be conservative, but it's also important to say that while we're conserving our own values and so on, there are nevertheless ways that let us work more efficiently and more meaningfully. And so which is why when I'm um, arbitrating in those policies, I, I encounter very little opposition. There is no public servant so far who stand up and fight with me saying, no, I want to work more hours every day. No, I want to make my, my family even more miserable. No, nobody say that, right? Everybody really wants to simplify their work and their workflow systems. So I would never really push through anything without the public service gets ready for it. But I will continue to experiment and let people generally see what kind of pros and cons are there for introducing those systems. Um, well, this is actually a sensitive question. Uh, is Mayor Cus I voting a success? If it's not a success, how do we improve it? Um, well, the joint platform is not just for the national administration. It actually has a Taipei City uh, part. If you click the Taipei City part, you will see that they say, and it's not my words, they say that uh, before it actually goes through I voting, there should be a general discussion period, a verification period, a collaboration service that unifies people's proposals and their petitions so about 3,000 people gets a more focused understanding just like we did with the national proposal with 5,000 people before putting it to i-voting. So um, at the moment it's still kind of new, right? So the most we have is about the painting material uh, of, of roads, right? Uh, and it's already about 16 people, still some ways to go. If you feel strongly about it, feel free to go there and countersign um, the petition. But the point here is that it actually does improve the quality of i-voting because it lets more people input their authentic experiences into the policy forming method instead of just letting a few um, people or experts determine the four or five options. Uh, it actually offers a much longer time for people to propose more reasonable options. And we can also, in the future, use those pros and cons, red and green interface to sort through those uh, contributions, which I think is going online in a few months uh, from now. So uh, in any case, what I'm saying is that uh, the iVoting people eventually realizes that the, the, the options here are actually the most important thing. And for the voting to be binding, the option should accurately reflect the uh, positions of people instead of just a few experts and so on, which is why they started this early stage process using the joint platform as the input to the i-voting choice making process. And all this is uh, the, in the words of the Taipei City people, so I don't have to offend anybody. <laughs> so their own i-voting committee thinks that using join as a input is a good thing. Um, can I tell you some specific successful cases in promoting technologies in government agency? Sure. Um, so if you look at PETA's uh, website, in addition to this hot pot thing, uh, which is a film, um, we also have our general agenda on participation and transparency. 
but there is also this part called accountability. Um, and accountability, we choose the word terrific, responsible, so that it will translate to uh, in Chinese. Uh, and if you click through uh, to accountability, um, it will show you some QR codes. And in the QR codes, there are write-ups from like uh, blocks from, well, this is automated translation, so um, anyway. So, so all this is what we call a track record for policy making. Each of those case studies start uh, with the thing that we're trying to solve, the actual website that finally gets designed. What kind of prototypes do we get? And then what kind of uh, mandates from the legislation that we try to answer um, helping the Premier in, in fulfilling his promise to uh, the people and also the Parliament. And so all those information, how we negotiate, how we talk with uh, different units, everything uh, is collaboratively edited by people who attend those meetings, edited for 10 working days, and then um, uploaded into it. So if you need some convincing, uh, you can actually quote any of these things, like when uh, the rolling um, storage of, of uh, those vegetables, right? This is confidential information, otherwise we will uh, influence the market if we release this data. But I said, you know, even national secrets gets released after 10 years. Even if it's absolute top secret, it gets released after 30 years. So how long do you need to wait before it gets open data? It's like, actually, 24 hours. <laughs> it's just nobody bothered to ask this question before. So, so it was never made open data. But, but be because this question gets asked, it's like, yeah, sure, by the next day, there's no way it will affect the, the price of yesterday. It's safe to release. Which is why we say, okay, sure, so you upload to the open data platform the next day, and it's actually just fine. Right, so, um, so yeah. All, all those case studies uh, can be seen here. Uh, there's also a very similar one about uh, the eSport, uh, where I try to convince people who may be more senior and haven't played eSport and convince them their way to, that the game Go is actually a eSport now. So, so anything that you realize about Wei Qi is actually applicable to, to eSport because it's now a game that's played online, that's performance-based, and that computers play as big than human beings anyway. So uh, it is now uh, very, very much an eSport and should qualify. Um, the eSports should, should do everything that the uh, Wei Qi athletes now enjoy, and so on. So what is my comment on coding education, which will be implemented to all the school kids in Taiwan, well, high school kids in Taiwan, and not next year, unfortunately. It will be uh, well, one year after next year. Um, I, I think it is, it is generally, to me, it's like a foreign language. Uh, and then it is important, like a foreign language or a special language, like the law. Uh, we're not training all the kids to be lawyers or lawmakers, but it is important that everybody has a sense of what law is instead of just a bunch of lawyers controlling how laws should be interpreted. There should be a ladder of expertise, which is why we're trying to integrate information technology as early as primary school in all the different fields of education instead of just one coding class. So the literacy here is, is much more important. If they're interested in law lawmaking, of course they may well become lawyers or lawmakers, <clears throat> but there is all sorts of positions of para uh, professionals, of all sorts of um, people who interpret the, the legal opinions for their families and so on, and all the way to the general people who, who has a general idea of what law is. So coding for me, code uh, is law in, in many senses. It's like physical law that describes what's possible, what's not possible in the digital world. So it is important that people know what algorithm is, what data is, how a algorithm and data form our daily lives, and how to read code and not get scared away from it, that it is actually a system underneath and so on, but not everybody need to be writers or lawmakers and so on. But it is important to be able to appreciate and understand the next 
step of the latter's people's opinion of uh, what is going on legal wise and this is how the society adapts to technology change it was introduced of course by people who specialize on this technology but as they get a dialogue with other like legal people and other people working on culture education economy and so on they need to get translated further down the ladder uh, in a way that is much more accessible by people who understand a little bit about this topic to explain to people who doesn't uh, understand a little bit. But if everybody doesn't at least have some basic understanding of what words mean, that there's no way for this translation process to happen, there's just some experts and everybody else, and this is not a healthy uh, society to adapt to technological change. Um, it was said that I don't like getting scored. Uh, so what are the good ways um, to, to evaluate uh, how, how good it is? Well, I don't like scoring because scoring artificially compels people. And I don't like uh, people to build their self-esteem based on the relative status to other people because it's normatively mm, uh, I would say it's normatively fragile in the sense that people will feel helpless if uh, all their self-worth is based on relative status because mostly controlled by other people and not oneself. So if I set some goals, if I say there's a direction that I am going, I should be judged just by how far or how near am I to this general direction, the vector, and gets you know, scored, it, why not? but not by an artificial scoring system that conflates everybody's directions into one metric. So which is why all, of all the foreign media who ask me to compare Taiwan with Singapore, with Hong Kong, with uh, Korea, with Japan, and I always say, well, Taiwan is number one at being Taiwan. And uh, this is not... This is not a joke. We, we, we have a general direction going forward, and we set it collaboratively. But everybody still has our own personal goal, and it's also important for everybody to work on their own dimensions and evaluate uh, the regulatory work against the public servant's own volition, what they want to do, what you want to see from this government. There is no, like, one premier or president or a minister that not knows everything and says that the direction for everybody. What we can do is try to um, absorb the current information, the current trends, and set some values, some general direction that are not contradictory to each other. But everything else is up to, to you folks, right? So, so it is important for every public service worker uh, to, to just see what you would like to see uh, in the public service and try to find a way to make that happen instead of just to say, you know, it's, it's all the direction of the, you know, 10 year, 20 year agenda. There is no such thing. We can build a 20 year scenario together by using our imagination together, but when it comes to implementation, everybody will have to do their own scorecard. Um, the digital um, government, um, there is a I voting thing, right? So, um, well, if this is about sampling, the, the survey methodology, there's a very long literature about how to make sortition or survey of this kind of representative in, in idea of demographics and so on. But I think the most important thing is the listening process, the discussion process that goes before voting. Because if you just go to voting, it is very rare that you will get 90% or 95% consensus. It's usually 70% or 60% or so on. And you leave most of the people actually not that satisfied. Maybe they just see three choices and have to choose one that they don't really like. Or, you know, in the case of three choices, maybe more people get disappointed by the result than people who get the, the result that they wanted, right? So I think the point is that for people to, to generally converge to the things that they can all live with, so that all the three options at the end of the discussion, I can all live with it because I've heard sufficient deliberation and arguments from the people who argue for all those three positions and those positions are broadly applicable to my case also so that it improves the overall satisfiedness of people who participate in the final binding voting but without this process I think it is actually much more divisive than before uh, when we only have to vote once every four years um, 
the question is how to adjust oneself away from negative thoughts. Well, um, I think it is about having a spare room in one's mind where there is sufficient room for the negative thoughts to dwell, to, to live on, but there's also nearby rooms where you can look at uh, through the windows internally to the negative thoughts and also make a conversation with the negative part of you. If there is uh, no sufficient room, then one negative thought enters and it occupies the entire mind and there's no room to think about everything else. But I think it's important to have other rooms that represents uh, different states of mind together. And for me, personally, poems, music, these things help so that I will spend a lot of time doing translation or doing poetry and so on, so that my mind remembers a particular state of a poet, of a, of a mind, and so on, so that when I enter a negative thoughts, there are those thoughts uh, inside my brain, my mind, that still are distinct from this one negative thought and can have a dialogue with it. So, yeah, whether it's positive or negative energy, it all gets absorbed as energy. So, <laughs> right. um, well, I, we're running out of time. Um, so, let's just very quickly uh, look at the rest of the questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, there, there is no way that I can go through this in, in, in four minutes uh, in English. So I will, I will uh, take a break in protocol and switch back to Mandarin and try to answer all this in Mandarin. Uh, then, 还有三分钟嘛，那我们就非常快速。我觉得科技产业的重点是说，每一个领域它现在不是只是单一领域，我们现在是汇流到各个不同的领主线、生产、半导体这些东西，它 enable 的上面的这一层，那创造层。所以说，如果我们现在还在讲特定的发展方向的话，其实是对这种跨域或者取消领域的新一代的创作者是不利的。我们现在在看的时候，这些领域怎么结合起来，让他们能够去创造他们自己的领域，可能十个团队就有十个不同的领域。嗯，让科技政府新进的方式，刚刚已经讲了，就有一个 feedback loop， 让每一个人的这个概念可以用，甚至是匿名的方式，让让决策者跟中间的每一个人是看着相同的这样一份资料，就比较容易去 improve。嗯，然后最基本的这个 IT 的 technology 哈，这完全要看你的工作的这个执行。其实重点是还是科技要来配合你了，不是你来配合科技。所以说，如果你的工作上面有任何地方你觉得应该要改善，那我们需要一些新的 device 让它改善呢。我们我还是要讲前瞻技术建设，里面有有一大部分就是这个。然后在接下来的数位政府 plan 里面也包含在院里在地方政府的工作环境的的异化哈的升级。那 e payment 呢？其实不需要我们特别 promo， 我们只需要不要挡住它就好了。这个这个政府一向都是这样子的，所以重点是说，我们只要在这个调试的过程里面，让大家都知道这件事情是怎么回事。我觉得 e payment 它会自己长出来。嗯，我进入现目前的这个工作之后，我觉得政府它。的感觉其实跟我在外面的感觉是一样的，它就是一个呃，我我在出国的时候常常那个大家都说台湾数位政委 （Digital Minister）， 可是呢，因为参加联合国。系统的一些场合，像 OGP 的时候呢，他就会发一个粉红色的，意思就是是一个 NGO， 但这个 NGO 还是叫台湾，他还是叫我 Digital Minister， 其实不算是一个政府嘛，因为不是那个联合国里面，所以说我在外面感觉就是很像这个两千三百万人的一个 NGO。那在在在这样的情况之下，其实它是一个不同的 perspective， 就是让我们去看说，哎，第一个我们比起其他 NGO， 我们可能不需要那么大的强制力。那另外一个就是说，我们的整个目的是是 non-profit， 是为了让大家生活过得更好。那其实，在做这件事情的时候，我的心态多多少少有所转。别的 NGO 可以做更好，我们就让别的 NGO 来做哈，是是这样子的一个概念。呃，然后呃 ，internal join 这件事情到底是怎么回事呢？这个就是公共政策参与平台，但是呢是给公务员用的，然后也可以匿名取昵称的方式去做联署等等，然后就让大家把自己可能透过公务人员协会有一些这个按照目前公务员协会法比较不能够反映的事情，能够在上面反映，然后让政务委员或者院长这些我们也会注册一些账号上去去跟大家。进行讨论跟沟通，呃，数位国家政策这个我们到底要怎么样把它落实？这个就是我刚才在刚刚那个简报里面讲的。我想最重要的一点还是把我们目前现有的服务做排。
盘点，然后去做串接，而不是去一直写新系统我我还是觉得 KPI 应该是负的哈，系统这个新系统是越少越好，最少是负的。那我自己没有什么建议，我建议就是我们闪开让专业的来，所以有很多这个专业的服务设计师现在在办这个黑客松，正在慢慢的帮我们去想这件事情。嗯，这个感谢这个一个老的灵魂，然后有这个 passion 的一个古老的骨头，知道什么意思？对 ，curiosity inside。然后呃，这个重点是说怎么样用用 technology 去做 decision making。那我们未来会一直在 p e d i s 网站上面，除了开放政府大火锅、开放政府沙威玛之外，也放一些相关的教材上去。那也希望大家能够多多指教，也随时给我们问问题。那在年轻人这边，我们重点是不要让老人来代表年轻人说话，而让年轻人走进这个公共政策制定过程里面，帮自己说话。那我们接下来青年咨询委员会的网站上面会有很多关于这个新的 process。呃，除了要求这个嗯、呃、efficiency 跟 transparency 之外。对手 minister 还要再做什么事情？没有哎，我这这一任能把这两件事情做好就已经差不多了。接下来的参与或者是课责或者是涵容的系统，我们在现有基础上可以多少做一些尝试。但是你要大规模的这样撒出去，绝对是在我们先把最底下的行政数位化跟透明做好之后，才能够来开始的。呃，那这个刚刚已经讲了，是说我们可以用 AI 来帮忙去分析大家给的各种意见。有人问说，是不是需要一个数位事务部？我我觉得是不需要了啊。那个就跟这个我们丽君部长说要四十四个文化部是同样的意思。我们现在的开放政府联络人的重点是让部门之间能够互相合作。我们如果回到本来的那个就是 reporting structure 的话，你又生出一个不来的结果，就是说那其他部就把事情这样子堆过去，那这样子这个部又变成首发了，到底？什么好处呢？重点是说，这个部会是要它每个部会之间，甚至每个三级机关之间，要能够去落实这个服务串接的开放政府的概念。所以，同样的这件事情，就是让更多，就是我们在做的时候，就觉得我们是在对一个机器人做的这件事情，真的交给机器人去做，然后人跟人之间多一些时间做一些只有人跟人之间才能够做的事情。政府会有呃个人资料，那当然我们 cyber security 非常非常重要，自通安全。那另外就是我们要对各自的利用呃做一个这个非常一致的解释。那这个最高行政法院已经在帮我们建保案的时候给了一个很好的采示，所以我们接下来就是在搜集、处理、利用的时候，会有一个更明确的一个方式哈。那是不是多数暴力网络霸凌？我们目前的刚刚讲的 super majority， 好像如果有两组，分别是八十趴、二十趴的时候，我们的算法是你要八十趴的全部加上二十趴的一半，要到九十趴才算过关。所以你不管捞多少人来到八十趴，你还是要说服少数的一半。那所以这个这个重点很重要，就我们要让捞人来这件事情变得不那么重要。你只捞一千个人来，他们所有的投的票都长得一模一样，在这个 point 上面，它只是一个点。我们这边算的并不是它的面积，这个面积是它的 idea 多 diverse， 它多能够涵容不同人的观点。我们这个完全不是比人数的，所以当你在这边看到两百零三，或者这边是五百四十九，这边两百零一的时候，你可以看到它的面积跟它的人数一点关系都没有。我们要的是这个东西的意见的多元性，我们要的并不是呃去数人头啊。我觉得数人头在感受跟事实阶段是没有什么好处的。那这个。呃，有人说这个每个这个机关要自己管机房啊，这个<咳>经费的问题啊，这个就我只好说这个，请支持这个机房向上集中绿能机房计划，呃，这也是在前瞻基础建设里面。好，那但 anyway， 如果在一立修之前，先透过网络平台。探寻民意哈，会不会比现在好？其实我觉得政策都是滚动式的了，所以说不只是这个法案本身，因为毕竟是立法院嘛。我在行政院，我很难告诉立法院说，哎，立法委员，这个这个你们接触民众应该用什么方式？这个我向你们咨询，向你们克责，应该是反过来的。所以就是说，呃、嗯，我现在在行政院里，大家没有办法来指导立法院，但是我们尽可能在他送进立法院之前啊，我们再多花一些时间去收集利益关系人的意见，也等于帮立法委员做一些功课。那所以是不是这个所有的我目前的 website 是的？呃，我们刚刚讲到 pds pdis 点 tw 的网站底下就有网所有这些连接。那今天讲的那个前瞻的 Q&A， 它基本上就是 ey 点 gov 点台湾，就是行政院的全球资讯网。呃，一进去就可以看到这个前瞻基础建设，然后进去之后就按红色的常见问题集就可以到了。这是唯一一个就是你可能要从行政院官网进去，而不是用 pds 进去的，因为我们。才刚写好，好，大概是这样子，谢谢大家。
谢啊，唐政委员，今天来了非常精彩的一个下午的一个演讲哈。我想第一个，他展示了一个我们刚才讲开放跟互相参与的一个参与的模式哈。这对我们来说也是很惊艳的一个过程。本来以为想说这么开放式的过程，哇，题目从这 i voting， 从机器人，从 recipe， 祖母的 recipe 哈，一直到个人一天怎么开展一天，从但是最后还是可以帮我们拼凑出一个非常完整结构性的对于所谓的啊、呃，我们讲数位治理开放政府等等这样的一个面向。的一个诸多的一个啊、呃、结构性的一个面向，我想这真的是非常非常的厉害哈。那今天呢，也谢谢我们唐啊唐呃政委员呢给我们很多的鼓励，因为刚才有一个题目我忘了跟你做了一个报告跟说明，为什么说五十一岁的高阶文官？因为刚好我们这边是全国哈最高阶的这个训练班，那刚好我们这一班所有加总前，我们的 average age 就是五十一岁哈，所以也就透露我们的恐惧哈，就是我们到了这个年龄还可以跟得上脚步吗？那的唐政委给我们很。很大的一个信心，是的，永远不嫌晚，哈，永远不嫌我们刚再闹一群比我们老的人，我们就是可以跟上了哈。那这个今天这个也非常谢谢啊，唐正，我想今天一开始的一个一个 slice 对我来说一个其实是啊，唐正没有提，可是我觉得那三个呃 slogan。很关键啊！其实整个我们开放政府就是有三个目标，一个是我们的卓越国家，我们要创新经济，我们要智慧治理。那也就是我们从一开始唐政委跟我们提示，事实上整个这个数位呃开放政府的核心概念是要促进我们的经济的发展跟我们国家的一个发展，而这里面我们要用 innovative 的方式来进行一个新的发展经济的过程跟治理过程。这里面政府是一个核心的角色，而这里面我们需要 inclusive。要把我们人民的力量带进，人民的呃这个意见带进来，所以这里面有一个非常结构性跟逻辑性的一个运作的模式。那这里面我们也很振奋哈，原来 KPI 呃是可以被丢到垃圾桶去了。<笑>好，那我们再次谢谢我们唐政委今天带来的我们非常非常精彩的一个演讲，谢谢。